is Thursday, September 1st, and this evening I have Richard Cole back. Richard is going to be discussing Douglas Dwayne Dietrich, who has quite a history of making some pretty insane claims, which Richard has done an excellent job of substantiating the falsehood of almost every one of these. Dietrich is like, and I've listened to as much as I could stomach, which wasn't frankly that much, Richard, of Douglas. I can't quite describe him in any other way as completely detached from reality. Um, you know, he's a self-described public informant, DOD research librarian, U.S. Marine, mercenary, San Francisco police officer, and the cherry on top, the biological son of Adolf Hitler, correct? That's correct. He, he first started claiming that uh, in December of 2018. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He is a nasty son of a bitch, isn't he? He is. Um, I think, I yeah, think that, you know, of all the people uh, on the Internet uh, with false uh, claims of military service, um, Dietrich is uh, the absolute worst I've ever seen. Yeah. And he spent, what, 20 since 88, about 20, 22 years creating this fiction, which he maintains to this day. I believe so, yes. yes. Yeah, it's pretty elaborate, this deception, isn't it? I mean, it's just so strange. It is. It's strange. It's elaborate. Uh, it's constantly uh, uh, adding to it or embellishing what he's already created. Uh, and it's uh, it's just morphed into <laughs> something very bizarre. Yeah, and you're one of – it's you and it's Steve, what, Outrim? That, um, you're the only two guys to really – dig deep into this and research all his wacko claims. That's correct. Yeah. I, I mean, he's, he's sort of a reject at this point, but the, the cult of personality <laughs> and the cult that surrounds him has become, even though it shrunk in size dramatically, I mean, this guy was a first class nutter and elevated himself to just, I, I, Honestly, the power he has over the people that follow him is immense. It's it's frightening. So I'm going to let you and, and that the stalking that this group does, the cyber stalking and gang stalking they do, and character assassination and defamation of character, and you've suffered from a lot of that in confronting him, correct? Yes, I have. Uh, yes. You know, most of it uh, since uh, 2017 now. It still continues. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty extraordinary. I mean, he's extraordinarily abusive and persistent. <laughs> and his persistence is, uh, you know, I don't want to give him credit for it, but his persistence is uh, off the charts. It really is, yep. Never well, seen anything like it. Ever. Yeah, I the crazy, just in his, his whole... Yeah, these videos, I mean, the whole persona is, it's very strange. You know, he reminds me of a cross between, and you and I have discussed this, but, you know, Charlie Manson <laughs> and uh, and Jim Jones, but just far more delusional. I mean, Manson's an act. I think, uh, you know, to a greater extent, he played the part after, you know, for probably the last 20 years, and Jones was just a full-on, you know, nutcase, but... Dietrich believes he's somehow convinced himself that everything that comes out of his mouth is true. And it's all just one enormous lie, one after another. It, it's it, quite bizarre. Anyhow, I've never encountered anyone <laughs> quite like him. He's just uh, creepy, to be honest. I'll tell you what, R Richard, why don't you take it away uh, with the timeline? And I think you're going to begin with uh, George, his father. Yeah, I think it's important that I bring up uh, George uh, Joseph Dietrich um, simply because uh, the record needs to be cleared up and uh, not just from uh, Dietrich's stories about his father and the embellishments about his military service, um, but, uh, but my connection to uh, investigating that and researching that. And I think uh, that uh, the record needs to be set straight on that. Okay, 
take it away. All right. Well, the, his father, George Joseph Dietrich, uh, was born October 23rd, uh, 1919, and died uh, March 26, 2007. Uh, he was born in Rochester, New York. And uh, uh, Dietrich claims that his father escaped Rochester, New York, uh, because he was facing some kind of inevitable future uh, working at uh, working for Eastman Kodak. Uh -huh. and, and supposedly, the way Dietrich tells it, uh, people who were working for Kodak at the time were being poisoned by chemicals and had a rotten life and, and were basically uh, working inside of a, of, of a, of a closed uh, jail type environment, which is not true, but. No, I've actually been, been up there. <laughs> I've yeah. been to a lot of the Kodak <clears throat> facilities off the Hudson and up north, yeah. and they're actually quite nice. Yeah, and this was at the time. But uh, yeah. it had it had its quirks. Eastman was a little quirky, but hey, but well. yeah, but it, but it was nothing uh, abusive and you know contamination of, of of people, health problems and all that. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but to say that his father enlisted in the Navy in 1935 at age 16 uh, to get away from that is just absolutely untrue. Yeah, and and he claims that his father served in the Navy first uh, uh, in China. Yeah. Uh, on the Yangtze River gunboats before World War II, like from 1935 to 40. And that's untrue because my findings of the U.S. Uh, census record at the time that I found on uh, Ancestry.com show George Dietrich living in Rochester, New York, and he was employed as a pin setter uh, at a local bowling alley, and he had worked at uh, uh, a milk process and and delivery company as well uh -huh. and so that shows him employed and 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 you know yeah in, in rochester in 1940. what wasn't his grandfather too involved in the the uh the milk processing or milk delivery business weren't they involved yes wasn't they it? were yeah, yeah it, it was big in rochester at the time and, and a lot yeah. of guys and a lot of guys uh stuck with that and and but some of them uh such as dietrich's uh, grandfather uh, did go to did go to work for Kodak and retire from Kodak. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and uh, George Dietrich and we know that this is the the icing on the cake here is that uh, had George Dietrich uh, served in China at the time, he would have been awarded the Yangtze Service Medal and the Navy China Service Medal, and he was not. Yeah, he would have been a flying tiger. <laughs> No, not a flying tiger. Those came later, and those were Army <laughs> or, or Army Air, Air Corps. Corps. Yeah. Well, Army Air Corps and and Navy uh, pilots. Yeah. Not sailors. how much later? How much later did those arrive? Uh, how much later did what arrive? The flying the, tiger. The, yeah. The flying tigers were created in July of 1941. Oh, okay. I thought they came earlier for some reason. I thought they were over there in 38 or 39. Uh, prob probably probably uh, back and forth. Uh, uh, diplomatic wise, but as but as far as pilots and aircraft, uh, they weren't even starting to recruit uh, right. until after August of uh, 1941. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Continue. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, but uh, his father served honorably uh, from June 1941 to August 1965, retired at the rank of petty officer first class, which is an E6, and. Uh, I mean, it's 24 e years, 24 years. E6 yeah. or E7? E6. Okay. Now, a chief petty officer is E7. Okay. Petty officer first class is E6. Okay. Okay, so uh, I had requested and, and received uh, his uh, father's records under the Freedom of Information Act in 2017. And uh, so I thought I, I would be able to piece together his World War II service. The thing was that uh, uh, there was nothing as far as duty assignments uh, listed for World War II. Okay. It just, it's, it's simply, I, and I don't know why that was, but um, uh, it just showed his, his date of enlistment and that he, that he enlisted on the East Coast. And, and it didn't show anything for his service, but it did show his awards. That he yeah. was given, and yeah. one of and one of those was the Asiatic Pacific Campaign Medal, uh -huh. 
and so I didn't know this at, at the time. I hadn't researched it. So I sent his uh, uh, copies of his uh, record uh, to John Lilia, who was an, was an ex uh, Green Beret and, and uh, military records expert. And I asked him to take a, a look at that, and because um, I wanted him just to, to, you know, how do I find out this guy's World War II service record? Well, Lily, Lily was kind of quirky, and uh, you know, I asked him about the uh, about the Asia Pacific Campaign Medal, and he just signed it. He just didn't want anything to do with it, you know. And uh, I and I said, well, that's that's an example of combat action right there, but. Uh, but he wanted nothing to do with it, so I went ahead and, and did the research on my own, you know. But that—that that was the evidence of combat action. All I needed to do was, was try to find out somehow where where he might have served uh, in in the Pacific. Right. So, yeah. But so, I mean, and and uh, yeah. Um, so I started doing research about that. And uh, and his grandfather as well. And so I was using uh, newspapers.com and ancestry.com to do this. Right. And so uh, and I was able to find two newspaper clippings from uh, the Rochester, New York Democrat and Chronicle, uh, dated 15 and 17 July 1945, uh, which mentioned George Joseph Dietrich and another Rochester sailor uh, as having served on the USS Pittsburgh. Right. Which was which was a, a brand new uh, Baltimore class heavy cruiser. Now this this was what I needed. This was the breakthrough that that I absolutely needed historically because now I've got a ship, and and if and and, and if I could follow the the history of that ship, then I know what what whatever uh, combat actions were because he was assigned to that ship. Yeah. Yeah, and and normally, and I've asked Navy veterans about this, and I said, now if you were a World War II sailor, and and you were assigned to a new ship, I mean, would you uh, would you stay on that ship, or would you would you get transferred off it? I mean, what would happen? And what they told me was that normally, because it was during the war, and especially this being a brand new heavy cruiser, right? Yeah. Um, as soon as soon as that keel was laid down, as soon as they started building that ship, they would start uh, preparing to, to have that crew. And I think it, it for the Pittsburgh, I don't know, it was probably uh, a crew of 50, 60 sailors, something like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, they would have been with the ship from for, at from the time it was being built until uh, they put it in the water launching and and uh and until it was commissioned and they would stay with that ship through the duration of the war unless right. something happened yeah you know, unless, yeah yeah unless unless they were wounded uh or or the ship uh, was damaged or you know something catastrophic you know? right now now didn't douglas claim his father had been um on several other ships like the franklin the Cowpens, the essex uh, as well during World War II, he did. Okay. He did, and and exactly that. Uh, um, but um, that couldn't have happened, as as Dietrich no. describes, because yeah. because the Franklin was commissioned in late January of '44. Yeah, and his father was assigned to the Pittsburgh in January '43. Yeah, so yeah. that that wouldn't be. Now the Cowpens was commissioned in May 1943, and his father was with the Pittsburgh already in January 43 and the USS Essex was commissioned in December 1942 and was was still operating uh, after the Battle of Okinawa yeah. and, ra and and raiding the Japanese home islands from July to August 45 while when the USS Pittsburgh was arriving back uh, to Bremerton Washington yeah. in July 1945 yeah so he was with that. He was on that that ship, which was a large ship for its class, right? Oh yeah, it, it was yeah. large. Uh, you're talking about. Well, let's see here. Uh, you're talking about a length of 675 feet. Yeah, she was a big girl. You know, yeah. a, 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 a width of 70 feet, 
Uh, I mean, you're, and you're talking armament of, uh, let's see, like uh, uh, nine, eight inch guns, yeah. seven, 72 five inch uh, guns. Wow. 48, 40 millimeter guns and 22, 20 millimeter cannons. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a, <laughs> that is something else. That's something else. Isn't it? I, I yeah. think he would, you know, as an eight, as a 19, 20 year old kid. Why would you want to leave that? that would, bounce I around, mean, man, you know? brand yeah. new, brand new <laughs> ship. Well, I mean, yeah. God, man. With all the toys, you can't beat it. Oh yeah. Now, so and we, of course, of course, uh, according to these two articles, uh, his father was a cook. He, yeah. So, yeah, so I he, saw that. Yeah. So he must have uh, had had been trained as a cook uh, on the East Coast and had probably uh, been assigned a shore station or possibly another vessel um, before they put him on the crew of the Pittsburgh. Right. Yeah. So, right. But he was serving uh, as a cook. Uh, and, it, you know, as of June uh, uh, 19... 45 af after the battles of uh Iwo Jima and Okinawa and yeah. it, he had he had two stars on that Asiatic Pacific battle and those two stars represent the battles of, I of Iwo Jima and Okinawa yep and of course uh, after the battle of Okinawa they were they intended to continue on uh, protecting these carriers as they moved uh, closer to Japan but they ran into a a, a typhoon uh on June uh, 4th of 1945 that ripped a 104 foot section off the bow. Yeah. And, uh, and so, but they managed to, for seven hours, these guys worked to save the ship till the typhoon stopped. Uh, yeah. they, another ship managed to get hold of the bow and, and uh, tow both the Pittsburgh and, and, and the bow to Guam. Yeah. Where, where they tried to, uh, to fix it up enough so they could get it back to the, to the United States. Yeah, those Pacific storms can be something else. You know, we think about our Atlantic Gulf hurricanes, but some of those typhoons are nasty. You're talking about a 600-plus foot vessel that gets 100 feet of its bow torn off. That is, that's a storm. Yeah. That's yeah. a storm. That's a storm. It is. Storm. It is. I've been through a couple of typhoons myself uh, on land, of course, but yeah. at, at sea, it's, it's just got to be a nightmare. Yeah, it's no, I, I, I went through a hurricane on my boat, which was a 42-foot trawler, but it was only a Cat 1. I think the winds peaked at like 80 miles an hour, and I just pitched the tubby bitch up in uh, the mangroves, threw out three anchors, and rode that out with yeah. the family in a hotel. And it was, you know, it wasn't bad, but had it been any worse, it would have been horrifying. Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine what it would have been like to have been on that boat at that time. Yeah. Now there was but, one other. There's one other ship, uh, John, that uh, Dietrich claims his father served on, um, and he's right about was the USS Oriskany, uh, the aircraft carrier. He served okay. on the. He according to his record, he served on the USS Oriskany uh, in 1959. Yeah. Now, but Dietrich says that he was serving on the Oriskany uh, in 1966 when a fire broke out. Uh, due to a magnesium flare and started oh. a fire and, and 40 sailors were killed. Um, but, 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 but he it, was on the Oriskany in May of 59, right? Right. Not 66. Like Douglas says. That's right. He retired yeah. in, in, in August 65. of 65. That's right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and in 1966, he was in Taiwan. Yeah. So why, why do you think Douglas made all this shit up? I don't know. I was yeah, about, it's about his about his father's service? Yeah, yeah, it just doesn't. I, I don't know. Like I said, it's totally it's totally unnecessary for him to have embellished his father's record. Yeah, I totally mean, un... he put a lot of thought into this. I'm sure that from what from what I've read about George uh, Dietrich, yeah, uh, that uh, I'm sure he he wouldn't have uh, been too happy with it. No, no, Because, no. you know, ac according to this article here. Uh, from the 1944 article, it says that uh, George, D George J. Dietrich is known to be as good as his word. And uh, he was able to send his parents a cleverly disguised message in a magazine after the vessel had been towed to Guam. Yeah. So, I mean, so that's, that, 
I mean, I took some balls to do that too, you know. So, oh, absolutely. So he came know. out of service in 65 and then he returned to Taiwan, right? Right. Where, um, where Dougie was born in Taipei. That's right. October okay. 1966. Yep. Yeah. God, I... I'd love to throw, you know what? I'm going to link some photographs. <laughs> Just unreal. Oh, yeah. So, so in, uh, in, um, I don't know what uh, George Dietrich did from the time that the, uh, the Pittsburgh got, got to Bremerton, Washington uh, in July of uh, 45. Um, there's that gap there from July to December 1945. The first of December is when his, uh, World War II uh, service uh, officially ended. Right. Right. But within 30 days, he had re-enlisted again and uh, started serving on shore stations and vessels on the East Coast uh, all through the Korean War. And he went to schools. Uh, he earned ratings of uh, storekeeper and aviation storekeeper. Uh -huh. And uh, so, and that, so, and he was assigned as a uh, storekeeper uh, to the commissary store in Taipei, Taiwan from uh, December 1961 to February 1963. Yeah, so he pretty much stayed, you know, in the, the, the farm herringbone milker game, you know, uh, milk delivery, milk processing, cook, and then more food commissary. So he stayed congruent in what he did throughout his career. Right, right. And, and what, but he did branch out into the aviation portion of that uh, yeah. in the Navy, which yeah. explains, which explains why he was later on served on, on, uh, on carriers also. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on to Dougie's birth over there in Taipei. Yeah. Well, he had, he had a sister, uh, Joyce that was born in, on March 2nd, 1963. Um, now that was one month. Uh, like I just said, um, George Dietrich was there uh, until February 1963. So one month later, Dietrich's uh, elder sister was born. Um, so, and from what Dietrich says, his sister was uh, a bastardess, he says, born out of wedlock, uh, who looked nothing like his father. But a yearbook photo that I found of her clearly shows the resemblance uh, yeah. between yeah. her and and. and and George Dietrich. And it's, yeah. it's at some point, I think, uh, of course, um, after George got out of the Navy in August 65, he returned to Taiwan. And uh, I think they got married at some point. And then uh, Douglas was born uh, October 20, 1966. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So, uh, yeah. So, but uh, his father passed away in uh, 2007. Yeah. And I couldn't, I, could, I, f I couldn't find any obituary or tribute, uh, you know, posted by Dietrich or his mother or, or a place of burial. But I thought to myself, you know, here, here's a retired Navy veteran and he would have qualified for burial in a, 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 a VA. VA cemetery. Yeah. Right. Just like my father does. Yeah. And, so, and so I d I conducted a search using the uh, Veterans Administration grave locator function, and I found that George Dietrich was listed as uh, being interred uh, in a cemetery in, in Walcott, New York. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Now, now, <clears throat> why would? I mean, Dougie got pretty elaborate with a lot of the awards that uh, you know his father received. Yeah. The Korean Service Medal, the Republic of Korean Service, Republic of Korea War Service Medal, the Vietnam Service Medal, That's and right. Republic of Vietnam Campaign Medal. Yep, and three Purple Hearts, and uh, all, all and, bullshit, and a few others. Yeah, well, um, the the United States Navy, like like I said, um, really didn't get into uh, the Vietnam uh, area of operations. Until right. after August 1965, I mean, just so what I'm saying is that <clears throat> his records don't show any service in Korea. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, or Vietnam. Right. Well, he, yeah, no, and if and if he had, then he would have had those awards. Yeah, absolutely. You understand what I'm saying? No, so, absolutely. But, but he was he was out. 
in August uh, 16, 1965, and uh, the Navy really hadn't, uh, I mean, gone into that area of operations yet. Now, when you did all this research, Doug basically, Doug, he came after you. Like you forged all this stuff, right? That's. Yes. I mean, well, the first. Yeah, he attacked you, right? Yeah, the first accusations were against uh, John Lilly because John Lilly was the one who published the documents. Now, Dietrich uh, w was unaware, and I think he still is, uh, that I'm the one that obtained those records, not John That's Lilly. Right, right. So, so right. and of course, his, his, his allegations of forgery or, or tampering or alter, alteration, I, I think, were, are simply to distract from his false claims about his father's service and you know to retaliate using defamation and slander uh against Lilia and, and me you know right. al although he was he was accusing Lilia of the alteration and forgery but uh you know late later on uh it was about me mostly <laughs> yeah so, so yeah but well he, he, yeah he, i mean but that's that's kind of is that where it began yeah that's with, where it began with yeah. with uh with this anim intense, I, I should say, intense animosity towards you. This is yeah. kind of where it began with Douglas, when you exposed yeah. the fact that all of his delusions about his father's service in the military were just factually completely entirely incorrect with one exception, which was one ship, but he got the date wrong. Missed by a mile on that. Right. Well, the animosity started. When I obtained, well, Stephen Outram had obtained uh, what's called an N three one, an NA one three one six four, on Dietrich. Yeah. So, but so, but to check on, but but, Outram uh, didn't tell me where he got it, and the way and the way he had cropped it, uh, you couldn't see the full document. So what I did was, well, I'm going to file my own, and of course I did. And what I got back was the exact same form with the exact same information. So, okay. You know, so big, so yeah, but and so when I started posting that, and Dietrich saw it, and and found out that it was uh, uh, had to do with with me, uh, then yeah, so then then I became uh, attacked uh, just as well as Outram had, and he had been attacking Outram for three years. Yeah, two. but you you became enemy number one at this point. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, listen, in the next segment, uh, we're going to be discussing basically the timeline after, well, at what we begin at roughly 68. We'll pick up there in the next show. Yeah. Okay. That works. Well, I know it was a little bit laborious for you, but I do appreciate you. There's a lot of importance there because this demonstrates really, you know, the beginning of Dougie's insanity. And um, yeah, we're going to pick up from where we left off. And I think it's going to get far more compelling through each episode. But I, I think, uh, you know, laying the groundwork here is really important. His father appeared to have been a normal, you know, hardworking guy uh, who did who lived his life, uh, you know, clean, worked, uh, you know, pretty congruently throughout his life. And, um, you know, nothing to I mean, not obviously distinguished career, but an honorable career. And, um, you know, why Doug would take that and turn it into something it wasn't, you know, his father's probably rolling over uh, where he's interned up there in Wycott. I think, I think possibly too. There's no reason for it. No, none. All right. Well, listen, Richard, thank you so much. And we'll pick up where we left off in the next segment. I greatly appreciate you coming on and laying the groundwork for this because it does spin insanely out of control. Thanks again, Richard. I'll talk to you next time, all right? You're welcome, John. Thank you. You bet. Take care.